Okay, now I will be presenting part two of a line-by-line -line analysis of why Ben Shapiro is a terrible writer who, des who does not deserve to be a New York Times bestseller. In part two, we'll be covering chapters two and three. Starting with chapter two, Prescott. Um, so, Prescott is the first okayishly written character, and I'll be explaining that later. So, quick summary. This chapter is about President Prescott, the incompetent president that Brett Hawthorne was angry at in the last chapter. The first part of the chapter is exposition about how uh, President Prescott became president and how he is the sleazeball. And the second part has him monologuing about this new government program he created called the Work Freedom Program for over seven pages. Seven pages of monologue. So, the thing is, the reason why I said that this is the first okayishly written part of the book is because the interaction between Prescott and his chief of staff, Bradley, is the first time any dialogue between two characters uh, developed their personalities by flowing naturally. I actually did end up getting that Prescott was a sleazy politician from those exchanges, and I did end up getting that Bradley was um, apprehensive about Prescott. But... The problem is that those were at most a page or two long. So, yeah. Why did I even go over that? It's, it's so minor that it doesn't redeem the story at all. Anyway, that doesn't justify anything else in the writing that Mr. Shapiro, all the, all the other messed up blunders that he commits later on in this chapter, or chapter three, especially chapter three. So, Moving right, in, moving right along, this chapter is about, this excerpt, sorry, is about Prescott's shady origins. <clears throat> he was no babe in the woods. He was a hardened ideologue, a product of the Chicago machine, the hand-picked protege of the power brokers. But he hadn't quite contemplated the nature of the country he'd be handed once elected. Okay, so you can immediately see the cliche, the babe in the woods. And, you know, that, that's obvious. That's bad because it's boring and overdone. But I'm not going to be focusing on that part. My issue is with the Chicago machine part. When Mr. Shapiro wrote this, who exactly was he referring to? So, I did a quick Google search for Chicago machine and I found this. Apparently, they're a defunct lacrosse team. And so that's not very politically charged. And it makes no sense. So I thought about what else the author could have meant by the term Chicago machine. And I recalled a school of economic theory that originated in Chicago. The Chicago School of Economics, based out of the University of Chicago, with notable prom proponents like uh, Milton Friedman and Stephen Levitt. However, the issue with that is, well, the Chicago School of Economics is a very pro-free market branch of economics, which is uh, precisely the type of economic theory that Ben Shapiro supports. And I find it to be highly doubtful that he would o attack his own side like that by, you know, attributing this sleazeball Brett... Ho no, not Brett Hawthorne. This sleazeball Prescott character to the Chicago School of Economics. So, um, my issue with all of this is that I have no idea who the power brokers or the Chicago machine are or is. The author doesn't refer to either of them later on in the book, and I frankly think that's a shame because having a shady conspiracy controlling the president, that isn't an original idea, uh, but it's far, still far more interesting than anything else in this book. So this next slide is a brief reminder of an issue that I've had with Mr. Perel's writing for part one. At the end of that video, I spoke about how he constantly inserts these Ben Shapiro-sized sentences at the end of paragraphs in order to try and grip the audience's attention. <clears throat> and nothing happened. Uh, you, see, you can say that again. And nothing happened. The economy sputtered and sputtered along, not quite collapsing, but certainly not booming. Even members of his own party wondered whether Prescott would win a second term. Then, a miracle. So I only picked this one because it was, it was particularly bad. Uh, so although this section would have been better if he had just deleted this sentence, or if he had just deleted the section altogether, he could have changed it to, um, then a miracle happened instead. Okay, so 
Now we're going to get into a serious issue with uh, Ben Shapiro's writing that makes it nigh unreadable to anybody in the general public. And that's the overuse of jargon. So, now, jargon is subject-specific terminology that is difficult for people outside of the field to understand. And difficult to understand can be divided in prose, can be divided into two types of difficult to understand, the good kind and the bad kind. And the good kind is poetic prose. That is imagery, that is prose that can mean multiple different things. Like, for example, you read a poem, you read a well-written poem, and it can mean multiple different things because the words can allude to different subjects. Um, because words like red can mean the color red. It can also mean red with anger, you know, you know blushing red. It can mean just a single word. Can, in poetry, you can mean all these different things. And you can interpret them all these different ways. That's why you go through poetry class in order to, <laughs> in order to discuss all the me- different meanings of poems try and find all those. Um, And that's what can make poetry amazing. However, uh, this Ben Shapiro stuff, the jargon, it's the bad, difficult to understand. And that's because of all this jargon. So these two excerpts alone contain 11 instances of political, economic, and historical jargon that make it a chore to read. Like, I feel like I'm actually studying here. And most of these definitions are things that you would learn in a high school economics class or history class. Um, But the thing is, you shouldn't be expecting your audience to immediately know what indirect taxes or executive fiat are. And I get it. Ben Shapiro's audience is conservatives, you know, people who are probably very politically interested in Ben Shapiro's ideas. But including all this jargon, um, it makes it very, very disengaging. It makes the prose incredibly uh, blocky. And here's the thing, okay? You don't need jargon in order to get a political point across. For example, I would say that um, novels like To Kill a Mockingbird... Brave New World, and The Grapes of Wrath are all highly political novels, uh, all with commentary that is still relevant in the mod- modern day. However, none of them contain the dry academic language that Mr. Shapiro uses in True Allegiance. And I think this is what really cripples the political message. Like, seriously, it's delivered like rhetoric and debate, and it's not integrated into the story. Like, regardless of what you think of the political message... Um, it, it's all just crammed down your throat and it's not shown to us through the characters. For example, um, in Brave New World, it's the experiences of the characters, um, the fact that they don't have any true meaning in their lives, that all art and beauty is uh, replaced with, you know, just, it's, it's all replaced with Soma and all these different distractions and, and hedonism. That, that's what that's the message of the story, and it happens to the characters, and that's why it's a political novel. But it, it's, it's still done through characterization. It's not done through jargon. Anyway, moving on. Sorry about that. The, this short and snappy bit is a simple uh, what the hell is going on, and how did this get published moment for me? And this is where Bradley, Prescott's aide, by the way, remember, is speaking to Prescott. Bradley nodded curtly. Then he reiterated, more slowly for the three-year-old, we don't have the money. And this is where Prescott and Bradley are discussing the budget. Okay, so um, then he reiterated, more slowly for the three-year-old, we don't have the money. So Ben Shapiro is telling us, that Prescott is, in fact, a toddler. A toddler. I- I'm baffled at how he wrote that and thought, oh, this is fine. So if he meant to say that Prescott was like a toddler, he should have phrased it that way. And if he meant to say that it was Prescott's third, in- third year in office, he should have phrased it that way. 
you know, he shouldn't have said Prescott is a, is a toddler, okay? Because Prescott isn't a toddler. You can say that he's like a toddler. You could, you know, be more specific and say that it's his third year in office. Or maybe it's just a typo, but why would you say that he's a three-year-old? The hell? Okay, so from now on, here on, it's, it's we get to the part with the monologue... And it's the monologue where Prescott give that gives about his political plans. And it's actually, I would say, okay from a pro's perspective. But it doesn't build the story at all. And I have no interest in covering it because it's so long and boring. And there's actually not that many problems with it from a spe- spe- specifically a mechanical perspective. And there's no... And because it, ha- it doesn't serve the story, this monologue should have been cut down. Like, if I were an editor... Frankly, I would have ditched this entire seven-page monologue and substituted something relevant to the plot. Okay, so, um... Moving on, we're going to be getting into Chapter 3. And Chapter 3 is... It's one of the worst things I have ever read. Just overall. And spoilers, there's... I actually, I actually will provide proof that this book wasn't edited uh, in this part. So yeah, moving on. So we get to chapter three with Soledad Ramirez, the domestic terrorist. So chapter three is about a rancher turned domestic terrorist named Soledad Ramirez. It starts with her baking a SWAT team a batch of cookies. Then it loops back in a very similar fashion to uh, Red Story. It starts with a flashback, by the way about how the SWAT team ended up there. This chapter is another exposition dump, okay? So it, first it goes on about how the government turned off their water and made her ranch dry up dry up because her farm was harming the local wildlife, and this made her far, farm uh, unprofitable, and she ended up having to fire all of her workers. Then one of her workers, a guy named Emilio, had to move to Los Angeles where his son was killed while going to high school by a bunch of gang members, and this made her sad, and she blamed the government for the boy's death, and then this made her want to bomb the government, which she did. Uh, so yeah, it's, it shows that Ramirez is quite an irrational character. And, and then the SWAT team came to her house, and she baked the SWAT team a batch of cookies. And then a civilian militia came to her house to defend her from the SWAT team. Yay! It's a very long and dull story that... Um, it's just... I hated this. I hated it so much. Uh, so, this is another example of the anxious prose that he spoke about in the first part of the series. The Environmental Protection Agency had ruled, and Congress hadn't overruled them, that they smelt fish were threatened by water overuse from the river. She protested. She sued. Okay, so smelt is a species of fish that lives in North America. So putting smelt fish right there is like saying fish, fish, okay? And it just shows that Mr. Shapiro is anxious about being understood. He's deathly afraid of being misconstrued. Okay, so next part, this part. Repeating yourself in the next part on the same on the next goddamn page she was a week away from filing when she received the letter it came from one of her former employees emilio the same day she received a letter from elenia emilio <clears throat> so as a writer i can immediately tell that these pages were written on two separate days it isn't uncommon for your first draft to contain repeated elements since you can't keep every single goddamn detail in your head. And that's fine. What's not fine is having that what amounts to the same sentence less than 250 words apart from each other in your final draft. The one that should have been edited twice. It should have been edited twice. Okay, so that's just redundant. Okay, so they flashed a picture of her looking surprisingly sinister and plastered it across the screen. This is the point where um, she's already bombed the building, I think. Like, she's already bombed the U- U.S. government building and CNN is 
putting a picture of her looking nasty on the page uh, on, on television whatever so this is this just needs a simple rewrite and it's they flashed a sinister looking picture of her across the screen it, it's overphrased that's all it is okay next part and this is the part where a bunch of civilian militia show up to try and protect her but around them in a wide circle were dozens of armed men over a hundred of them, actually. Okay, so this one, this one right here is uh, confusing. There's no reason to say that there were dozens of men around a person when you're going to outright state that there were over a hundred of them, actually, in the next sentence. There's no re need to go through numbers again, okay? <laughs> Describe their clothes, or their guns, or the way they speak, or anything else. There's no point in revising the number. Really? Okay, so... Now, this is the part where I have decisive ev evidence that this book was not edited. And this is a problem with the overall story of the novel, but it's such a blatant editing error that I had to point it out. One of her workers told her they didn't even have the safeties on. So, this excerpt is from the beginning of the novel. Oh, sorry, the beginning of the chapter, sorry. The part where Mr. Shapiro is describing the small team that encircles Ramirez's house. A worker informs her that the SWAT team has the safeties on their guns off. Keep that in mind. Now, this part is about how she had to fire Emilio. Mind you, this takes place before the SWAT team comes, since Emilio's son dying is what made Soledad bomb the U.S. government in the first place. He... Emilio, was one of the last men to be laid off as the ranch died. She cried this night she told him the cash had run out. He thanked her, hugged her, and moved his family to Los Angeles. So, the ranch is dead, and Emilio was one of the last workers she had to fire. But there's a worker informing her that the SWAT team has their safeties off. And you might be thinking... Oh, uh, that isn't a plot hole because it's because it's because the worker that informs her at the beginning of the chapter is one of the very very last people on the on her farm. Okay, well, look at this next part. So this is when Soledad is thinking about her weapons and allies. Soledad's weaponry was limited to the cutlery in her pantry, and that her only allies were a pet cat and a mangy dog she'd taken in. And this part comes right before the militia lives. So, uh, did Soledad forget to include the worker in her calculations? So, okay, let me try to explain the ramification of this plot hole. So, if the part about the worker saying that the SWAT team has their safety off is true, that means that Soledad still has money for her workers. That means she didn't need to lay off Emilio. Plus, it means more that she has more allies than a dog and cat. So, her reason for laying off Emilio is completely gone. And therefore, she has no personal, like, there isn't even an irrational justification for bombing the U.S. government building that she did. And this massive plot hole regarding all this, it takes place in one single chapter. Okay? And it's a chap chapter that's pretty short. Like, I think it's like under... 3,000, 4,000 words? Uh, so even if you disregard the sentence at the beginning, uh, then this is a contradiction that would have been easy to pick up. It would have been easy to pick up in a reader, right? Okay? And to me, that shows laziness. That just, show, that just shows plain old laziness. And it shows that the author knew, ah, whatever, I don't need to try, I don't have to try with this book because it's going to sell regardless. That's terrible. So, to conclude this video, I'll be going over some broader points in Ben Shapiro's writing. So it's very dry and mechanical, especially with the use of numbers instead of proper imagery. And you can see that with uh, the, the jargon use and also the use, and also with the 
constant restatement of the numbers. And the second part is uh, both Brent and Soledad's chapters were structured similarly, with their backstories being dumped in long chapter in- encompassing flashback slash um, exposition dumps. Prescott's chapter wasn't poorly written from a prose perspective, but that is because it was a massive monologue that went on for seven, for over seven pages. However, the slight few bits of interaction between Prescott and Bradley makes the former slightly interesting. So yeah, um, and also uh, I also went over the prologue in the last video. The prologue just su- just sucked. Anyway, besides that, um, with that finished, we are going to head on to, on to chapter five which I think is about, like, some African-American guy who lives in Detroit. I need to go look back at my notes on that. But anyway, that's the end.